Now then, as to the book of Revelation, I could give you maybe the whole story in five minutes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> That'll be a revelation. <laughs> in other words, I can give you the idea, if you'll accept it, at face value, just like it reads here in the book. If you want to turn, Henry, to the first chapter of Revelation, verse 11 there, we read here that John was told, what thou seest, write in the book, and send to the seven churches which are in Asia, and to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Mm -hmm. Now in verse 19, you'll notice here is the key to the whole book. The most simple book in the world to understand. Even the Pope of Rome and all Protestant interpreters can understand it. If they just put forth the least effort. Here's the key in verse 19. After John saw Christ in the midst of the candlesticks in verses 12 to 16, Standing in the midst of candlesticks, we were acquainted with that passage. Mm -hmm. Then in verse 19, what was the first thing John was told to write about? Write the things which thou hast seen. Write the things which thou hast seen, that is, this vision of Christ in the midst of the candlesticks. So chapter 1 is the first division of the book of Revelation concerning a vision of Christ in the midst of the candlesticks. What is the second thing he was supposed to write about? And the things which are. And the things which are, what is, what is meant? Things concerning the churches. To prove that, in chapter 2, 1, under the angel of the church at Ephesus, verse 8, under the angel of the church at Smyrna, and so on, till he had written seven short letters to seven local congregations of Christians in Asia Minor. Things which are. To prove that that consists of the things which are only referring to the churches, what is the third thing in verse 19 he was told to do? And the things which shall be hereafter. Things which shall be hereafter what? Well, hereafter the things which are. <laughs> hereafter the, the churches. To prove that without any shadow of a doubt, in the fourth chapter, verse 1, uh, after this, he said, I looked, and lo, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice, which was as a trumpet, talked with me, saying, What did he say there, Henry? Come up hither. Come up hither, and, and I, I will show do thee things which must be hereafter. I will show you things which must be hereafter what now? Or hereafter the churches, <laughs> see? That proves conclusively, you see, that everything from the fourth chapter, verse 1 on, to the rest of the book, does not deal with the churches or anything about the church. Deal with things which must be after the churches. That's very clear there, isn't it? He emphasized that in chapter 4 1. Now, if the things from chapter 4 1 on must be after the churches, then they must be after the churches. And if the things from 4 1 on must be after the churches, then the thing up to 4 1 must be concerning the churches. Or if these things must be after these things, then these things must be after these things. That's all we can gather. So for everything, if we take it from here on out now, we don't have to say another word about understanding Revelation. All we need to do is read what happens and put each event in its proper order, in executive order, just like you have it there. From the fourth chapter, verse 1 on, the next scenes are in heaven. All you have to do is believe that those things in heaven were seen by, G by John when he got up to that door in heaven. Don't inter interpret them. You're not, you're not required to interpret one verse of Scripture. In fact, God's going to judge you for doing it sometimes. <laughs> and you better be mighty careful because he said, if you had to do this book or take from it, you get in trouble. So there we have the idea of things in heaven, chapters 4 and 5. And in chapter 5, verses 8 to 10, we have a great multitude of saints in heaven standing before the throne. Uh, read verses 9 and 10 there, Henry. Verse 9 of chapter 5. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people See, and nation. here are some people that are already redeemed up in heaven, singing a song. Now, they, they got there some way, way didn't they? Some, by some mean? <laughs> Don't you think so? <laughs> It's they will have to get up yes. there by some means. All right. Now, this is a very early before Daniel's 70th week begins. Right at the very beginning. Here you have saints in heaven who are going to reign on the earth as kings and priests. Why are people then looking for a rapture seven years later at the second coming of Jesus Christ when they're already here in heaven in chapter 4? If these things must be after the churches, then the church goes up at this point. And the things you read about from chapter 4, 1 on are things concerning events concerning Israel, not, not the church. 
And if we could accept a simple fact like that, how easy, how simple the book of Revelation would be. Now we could point out other things, other group, groups of people coming out of that same, the same portion. Turn to the fifth, 14th chapter of Revelation and verse 1. We have here, I saw a lamb on my sign, with him 144,000, having his father's name written in the forehead. I heard the voice of harpers hopping with a harp. They sung a new song before the throne, before the four and four elders. No man could learn that song, but the 144,000, which were redeemed from where? The earth. From the earth. So they're from the earth. They're in heaven. <laughs> Look at verse 5. What does it say? And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Who are these? 144,000 Jews, they are also in heaven, aren't they? How'd they get up there? <laughs> You've got a problem if you can't. <laughs> How did they get up there? They got up there by rapture, of course. They are sealed in chapter 7, having the Father's name written on the forehead. And in chapter 9, 4 of the same book, they are the, the judgment angels were told not don't you hurt those men which have the seal of God in their foreheads in chapter 4, verse 4 there. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. You see, the 144,000 are being protected. They're caught up to heaven as the man-child of Revelation 12, 5, where in chapter 14 we already see that they are in heaven. So they are translated during these events of things which must be after the churches. Get the idea? Now then, uh, it, it, it is very painful sometimes to have to face uh, a lot of argument, uh, people contending one way or the other, church going before the tribulation or after the tribulation, during the tribulation, pre-trib, post-trib, all of the tribs. <laughs> There's no need of a lot of this if we just be simple and childlike and believe what the book says. I'm going to point out two or three things to you. I've got 45 definite proofs that the rapture of the church will take place before the tribulation. But right here's some of them, these saints in heaven already, before the seals and the trumpets and the files all begin. Mm -hmm. That's enough. But <laughs> turn to the 19th chapter of Revelation there, and I want to point out something that, uh, that is without controversy. You just can't get around it. No, all the king's horses and all the king's men can't get around it. And here in verses 7 and 8, uh, Henry, read that. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And who is his wife? The church. Look at the next statement there. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. See, you know that's the, the, those are the saints there. Where are these saints in heaven there? Or who are they? In heaven, in the air, or on the earth? In heaven. They're in heaven. I don't believe any person could, with a clear conscience could, could deny that. Do you? They are in heaven. Now then, verses 1 to 10 here then, naturally, must be fulfilled before verses 11 to 21. Isn't that the way these orders come, 1 to 10, and 11 to 21? Chronologically speaking. Now then, what happens in verse 11? And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, isn't that simple? Right after the supper. The supper is not held then in midair where they won't even have any place for table legs to set. <laughs> the supper is not held down here on the earth. And the saints, the church is not down here on the earth waiting for the second advent of Christ, as they tell us. Now here they're in heaven eating a marriage supper before the second advent even starts. For in verse 11 it starts. Mm -hmm. See? I saw heaven open after the supper. Or verse, are we going to put verses 1 to 10 way down there after verses 11 to 21? What are we going to do about it? Don't you think we'll just leave it like it is would be best? I think it would be good. Fine. All right. <laughs> all right. Now, here we have then the marriage in heaven, meaning that the church and all the raptured saints are in heaven before the second advent even starts. Then many of these fellows come around that the church is still down here on the earth having to face the Antichrist. They're going to have to have their neck cut because they weren't ready to, because the rapture doesn't take place before that and 
They're waiting down here for the second coming of Christ, not only to start in verse 11, but to land down here, see? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make sense to have the saints up there in heaven before the second coming of Christ even starts and then make it a part of the second coming of Jesus Christ. One of the greatest mistakes Bible scholars are making is this, making two phases or two stages of one coming of Jesus Christ. In other words, they call it one coming in two stages or two phases. I was so confused as a young man by Bible scholars, they would talk about the second coming of Christ and the rapture in the same breath, call it the same thing. And then they would uh, tell us, say, the Antichrist must come and the Antichrist must reign. And they, that was farther back than we are now, you see. Yeah. Yeah, that's 50 years ago, 50 or 5. And they would tell me that the uh, Antichrist must come to seven years of tribulation. Certain prophecies must be fulfilled. Certain signs must come to pass. And then you know what they would do automatically? What's that? They would say this, you better come down here to this altar tonight because he may come tonight. I never could figure out how seven years of tribulation and a lot of things had happened before I could get down to an altar. See, it was confusing. They believed in two phases or two stages of the, of the second coming of Christ, they call it, but that's not true. These are two distinct events, just as clear and distinct as any two comings you ever went into place from. The second coming of Christ is the second time that he will literally land on the planet Earth to fulfill a mission. Like the first coming of Christ is the first time that he landed on the planet Earth to live here and fulfill a mission. We know why he came the first time, and we know why he's coming the second time. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 plainly says, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority, authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And when all things shall be subdued under him, the Son himself shall become subject unto him that did put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. Now the purpose of the second coming of Christ is to set up a kingdom. Rule here on the earth forever. And that's where those, where those saints are going to reign you read about in the fifth chapter there. Mm -hmm. All right, now, the rapture is not a second coming of Christ. No part or no phase of the second coming. It's a distinct coming in itself out of heaven to the air, not to the earth. It's just like we'd make a trip from Atlanta here to Charlotte, and then the next trip I make, I'm going to make it to Asheville. I'm not, not going to, and you call that like my second trip to, to Charlotte. You know better than that. <laughs> and we know better than to believe that the second coming of Christ is the same as the rapture. The rapture is a two distinct events entirely. Now, the first coming of Christ out of heaven is that of meeting the saints in the air. He doesn't come to the earth at that point, therefore you can't call it a second coming of Christ. The, so the marriage of the Lamb was held several years after he comes and gets them. They get settled in their mansion. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. We're not so I would have told you. I go to, the, these fellows got, they got all you fellows squatting down on the ground waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ <laughs> down here. When you're supposed to be enjoying your mansion, you should have been settled in your mansions up there several years and had three square meals a day holder at the time for that. Huh? <laughs> I'd rather have that kind of a story than, than this other kind Amen. where we're going to have to face an antichrist and have our heads cut off. Well, at any rate, just a few minutes more on this point. The two comings are two distinct events. The rapture first, before the tribulation, all the events of Revelation 4, 1 through 19, 21 takes place between that point and this marriage supper of the Lamb in chapter 12, 19. Now I could give you 45 different scriptures, and let me give you just maybe one or two more. Oh yeah. yeah. Take for example, the 24, 21st chapter of the book of Luke, verses 34 to 36. After Jesus told us about the signs of his coming, distress of nations, the sun and way, moon or sea and waves roaring, and, and all kinds of judgments on the earth indicating the nearness of his return. Here's what he said in verse 34 to 36. Pray that you may be accounted worthy to do what? Escape. Escape. Escape what? All these things he said. What are these things that we're to, supposed to escape? the tribulation judgments and all those events, terrible events. So pray that you may be accountable worthy to escape all these things 
and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, if that isn't a taking out of the world of saints, I don't know what it would be. <laughs> Praise God. Huh? I like that. Uh, yeah. Well, that's it. Now, then, one more scripture that might even puzzle some of us as to its literal meaning, but it's not, not hard. All, all of the Bible's so simple. If you just start bragging on the Bible a little bit more, it'll, it'll become more simple for you. <laughs> Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter as from us, as that what? You got it there? Second as that Thessalonians the, as what, what, two, two, two. As that the day of what is at hand? All right, Second Thessalonians 2. What? To 2, verse, to verse 2. 2, 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. As at what now? As that the day of Christ the is... The day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive <laughs> you by any means. And read on the next statement now. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son See, of perdition. two things precede the day of the Lord, there it says. Mm -hmm. The day of the Lord is the second coming of Christ and not the rapture. Two things precede that. One, a great falling away, and one, the revelation of the Antichrist, who in verse 4, what does he do? Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That is. Now, the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the church is taken out of the way, and that's the next story here. Look at verse 6. You know what withholdeth he said in verse 5, that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now hindereth will hinder until, until what? Until he be taken huh. out of the way. Now something here is taken out of the way that hinders lawlessness. Isn't that right? Before the Antichrist can reveal, there's something that hinders him will be taken out of the way. The church. The church. No question about it, but here's what are you going to do with fellows who say it's not the church, it's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> or it's not the Holy Spirit church it's something else see we have we have to interpret the bible to see before we can understand it <laughs> that seems to be the attitude but now here's the point verse 7 says and then or rather it says verse 8 and then look at verse 8 what are the two words there and then and then see when he who hinders lawlessness is removed and is hindering lawlessness no more then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, referring to his destruction of the Antichrist at his second advent. See? Now here's the, here's the thing, it's just so simple that even a child can understand it. And that's the way I, what I like about that Bible. It's just that way. <laughs> now there are only three things that hinder lawlessness in the world today. And they are the church, Holy Spirit, and human governments. You know human governments are not going to be taken out of the world. That's out. It's between the Holy Spirit and the church that he who hinders will hinder here, you see. Now then, you can prove by many scriptures that the Holy Spirit will never be taken out of the world. For example, when Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to the disciples, I will give you another comforter that he may abide with you until the Antichrist is about ready to come, then no. we'll have to get him out of here. No, I didn't he didn't say Might that. get hurt, huh? No. <laughs> no, how long will he abide? Forever. 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 He will abide with you forever. Acts 2, 16 to 21 plainly says, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. During the time, he says, I'm showing wonders in heaven above, and that's in the tribulation. Showing heaven, wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor smoke, a sun to be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And listen to this, verse 21, it shall come to pass, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. People even tell you you're not going to get to be saved after the, after the rapture. The rapture doesn't change salvation at all. It only takes those that are ready. And the rest want to get ready later on. That's their, that's their business. They don't. That's their hard luck. But here's a simple statement that people will be saved after the tribulation. And that spirit then will never be taken from the world. That's the idea, isn't it? Then that only one hinder of lawlessness left, and that's the church. Now, I know what's in some of your minds right now. I can see those question marks rising high out there, <laughs> even the seemingly in the congregation out there in the, in the homes. How could a pronoun he refer to the church if the church is a woman? 
Oh, that's that's a tough one. Would you like a little information, or shall we just give it up? Yes, no, no go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Henry, turn to Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. He is our peace, who hath broken down the world middle wall of partition between us, that he might make of himself of twain one Ephesians two, what, brother? 2, 14 and 15. That he might make of himself of twain one new woman. Did I get that right? Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. All right. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, Yeah. having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. One new woman, isn't it? <laughs> no. No? No. Man? One I new wonder how long that's been man. in the English Bible. <laughs> how long has that been in the English Bible? Well, I don't see oh, any corrections right here. Years. So it's <laughs> <laughs> now look at the fourth chapter, verse 13, the same book. Fourth chapter, fourth chapter verse, verse 13. 13 of Ephesians. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect M A N. A perfect wo, W O M A N. No, 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 did Christ have a man's head and a woman's body? No. No. <laughs> he had a man's head and a man's body, didn't he? All right. Now that proves then that the church is compared in Scripture to a, to a man. And therefore, when you go back to 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, he who hinders the church, the body of Christ, he who hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then after that shall that wicked be revealed, proving that the church will be taken out of the world before the revelation of the Antichrist, you see. Now, 